Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. Today, I want to read to you an essay that I wrote for im1776.com on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and philosophy. I'm going to read it and I hope you enjoy it. Last year, marching steadily towards a midlife crisis, I asked my Twitter followers, What martial art would you start learning at age 40? I'd never done a martial art before and barely any sports beyond getting picked for the high school basketball team on account of my towering height. I'm six foot seven. But recently, I'd begun feeling the pressure of two imperatives, to know how to fight and to not feel like I'm 80 in my 40s. The overwhelming consensus among those who responded was Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's what they said to do. From what I understand, people who listen to popular podcasters Joe Rogan, Jocko Willink, and Lex Friedman among others, hear Brazilian jiu-jitsu mentioned every several episodes. Others discovered the sport through mixed martial arts or UFC. But before I attended my first class, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was completely unknown to me. I didn't do any homework. I just showed up. So I had no idea even what is a gi, what is no gi, the names of the movements, even what kind of sport it was, really. I just went on the recommendation of my Twitter followers. That was about four months ago. In week five, I broke a rib. There's a move called knee on belly, which is basically what it sounds like. Somebody puts their knee down on you. And uh, I had a big guy do that move on me, broke my rib. Took six weeks to recover. But now I'm back training three times a week and thinking about jujitsu constantly. It would be an exaggeration to call it an obsession, but somehow it's quickly become an integral part of my life and how it integrates with my other concerns, philosophy and education, has surprised me. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a grappling sport. You don't punch or kick anyone, but you do try to take them down from a standing position, and you try to put yourself into a dominant position over them. They, in turn, attempt to escape that position. If you really get them into some sort of submission, they tap to admit defeat. From another perspective, of course, you're the one who's taken down, you're the one put in a painful position, You're the one who tries to escape. When you start, your job is to suffer. Basically, when you begin, everybody's choking you out, completely crushing you, destroying you, demolishing you, and your task is to suffer and to learn to survive. As I write here, you get crushed and choked. Advanced players put you into positions where they could easily break your arm. You're killed over and over again, and it's great. The satisfaction isn't a fight club phenomenon. It's not that all day hunched over a computer, working on some trivial task, has made me want to reconnect with the visceral brutality of choking someone to death. Well, okay, maybe there's some of that. Rather, what I found unexpected about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was not its bare physicality, okay, because you are obviously grappling, rolling hard and all of that, but rather that the physicality is embodied mentality. Players often compare the sport to chess or to a language. Black belt Chris Matakis, writing in the Tao of Jiu-Jitsu, about his own love affair with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, has observed that Jiu-Jitsu is cognitively complex, so much so that there's a great barrier to entry in terms of intellect. I have never met a great Jiu-Jitsu player who was not highly intelligent, and I don't think I ever will. It's an old story in philosophy that man must find a balance between his intellectual life, which is, as it were, disembodied, and his physical life, which, if unchecked, can reduce him to a brute. In The Republic, Plato writes that too much gymnastic can make a man hard and insensitive to the higher pleasures, while excess in the direction of quote-unquote music can make a man soft and cowardly. So Greek education is a combination of gymnastic and music. Too much gymnastic, you become like a brute. Too much music, you become like a coward. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is enrapturing because it combines intellectual activity with physical expression. Every move has a reason. You don't act with noise and fury signifying nothing, but with calm composure, guided by syntax, producing a meaningful contest, not just of strength, but of study. All my instructors so far have emphasized the importance of calm in jujitsu. When you imagine calm, perhaps you see a beach in the Bahamas or a rejuvenating Sunday at a Swedish spa you probably don't imagine martial arts. But jiu-jitsu teaches you to maintain composure in combat 
and not to lose your head even when your untrained instincts want to take control. It's not an aggression release valve. After my second class, I started watching interviews that earlier I would have skipped over as boring. One of the first I saw was with John Danaher, perhaps the most famous living trainer in the sport. Okay, Danaher is a former academic. His field of study was philosophy, which I was surprised to learn when I was listening to him. But he pivoted to another academy, which is what jiu-jitsu training centers are called, and he became a professor there, which is what they call the black belts. So he was studying philosophy. He was going to become an academic, but he left the educational academy, went into the jiu-jitsu academy, didn't become a philosophy professor, became a jiu-jitsu professor. It's not a coincidence when highly educated people suspicious of the direction of the modern world and the modern university, to say nothing of the postmodern world and the postmodern university, turn towards martial arts as a practice where classical virtues survive. The high-minded pursuit of a jiu-jitsu practitioner pursuing mastery cannot coexist well with the modern world, Matakis writes. I don't insist that Brazilian jiu-jitsu is anti-modern, but still, those with a healthy skepticism towards the worst excesses of modern technological society can satisfy their hunger for a healthy alternative there. Okay? In other words, if you're intelligent and you have some qualms with the state of higher education and with the state of the modern world, you can satisfy your hunger for classical excellence, classical virtue, intellectual activity, the combination of music and gymnastic in the sport of jiu-jitsu. That surprised me. Brazilian jiu-jitsu, among other things, is highly ritualized. What do these rituals convey? Again, my impression after just being in the sport for a short while. So take this with however many grains of salt you feel are necessary, especially if you're more experienced in the sport and see things that I didn't see. But what do these rituals convey? Respect for tradition, commitment to discipline, gratitude towards teachers, and towards those who can help you grow. A sense of duty and responsibility towards those less experienced than you. So the higher belts work with the lower belts. They train with them, they help them, very important. Humility that isn't self-effacing. Willingness to learn, acknowledgement of progress made by effort, and the importance of fundamentals. In some way, the opposite values and virtues of the modern university, if you think about it, at least in the humanities. Something I didn't understand and didn't like about the university when I was there was that there was no interaction between graduate students and undergraduate students built into the education process. They were siloed off from one another as if in different, uh, as if different breeds. In jiu-jitsu, by contrast, you have higher belts rolling, that means sparring, practicing, or training, with white belts as their mentors, teachers, in a way. The white belt is a willingness to grow and improve, Matakis writes. It's a symbol of the courage it takes for someone to acknowledge a void in their life and the strength it takes to pursue its fulfillment. Once we are a black belt, we must not forget the importance of being a white belt or of what this represents. A jiu-jitsu master remembers his roots and seeks to help the new plants in the garden grow. Okay, I like that. I always thought it was weird that graduate students didn't work with undergraduate students to sort of bring them up, bring them through. And, you know, you could have undergrads, undergraduates learning from graduate students and vice versa. But there was nothing like that in the university. In the jiu-jitsu academy, there is. I like that. It's fantastic. Uh, and those of you who practice jiu-jitsu, you may have something to say about it, in which case I encourage you to comment. Some of these elements are common to all martial arts, probably, but there's an explicit connection in jiu-jitsu to wisdom. For instance, the canonical work Jiu-Jitsu University by Paolo Ribeiro opens with the following quotation. So this book, Jiu-Jitsu University, it's like a book about the various positions that you can find yourself in, how to escape, how to survive, how to submit, how to attack, how to do all of these kinds of things. And it opens with a quotation, quote, technical knowledge is not enough. One must transcend techniques so that the art becomes an artless art growing out of the unconscious, unquote. Minimally reformulated, this could be a Heideggerian meditation on the limitations of a technical interpretation of the world. You know, technique alone is not enough. The first page of the book states, if you think you are late, if you are late, you use strength. If you use strength, you tire, you know, you become tired. And if you tire, you die. That applies to combat situations, of course, right? If you're in a combat situation, you're tired, you might die. But it also tells us that there's a level of understanding beyond thinking. Because listen to the first part of the quote, if you think you are late. 
So there's a level of understanding beyond thinking, which depends on thinking, but becomes something like second nature or intuition. So I like that as well. You know, it's not raw instinct because you're not relying on your raw instinct. You're educating your instinct through training, study, practice, and sparring. But it has to become second nature. It has to become automatic so that between the moment you find yourself in a position and the moment you execute the right move, thought shouldn't intervene. Not because it's thoughtless, but because you've already put all the thought into it that now it's become second nature. To play well in the sport of jiu-jitsu, you must be in the zone, in a flow state. To get into that state, you must study and practice. These aren't, in my opinion, platitudes. They're genuine insights that are mappable into other domains. But when you do it in jiu-jitsu, you don't just get the theoretical understanding that, yeah, okay, some things have to become second nature. Every day that you go to practice on the mats, every day that you go to drill the various drills and techniques, to learn the various positions, you put yourself in that position where the thought is expressed in the body. You know, so for example, you're holding somebody here, okay? You're getting ready to do something and getting ready to choke them, let's say, okay? So you, they have like a uniform called a gi. You, maybe you're gonna put your hand there or something like that, you have a grip. But at the same time, you can't forget what your feet are doing. Because if you focused all your attention on what your hands are doing, the guy's gonna run around your feet and you're gonna be screwed in a way that you weren't expecting. Or you pay attention to what your feet are doing, you left a hand dangling, next thing you know, somebody's breaking your arm. You can't leave an arm dangling. So gradually you get this awareness of your whole body. And again, it's not just an awareness. <laughs> you guys know, like some time ago, there was this thing online about uh, word cells and shape rotators. Word cells are like the people who basically like me live in books. Okay, They have some verbal aptitude and fluency. And shape rotators were people who like I have a son who right now is becoming a Rubik's Cube expert. I could never become a Rubik's Cube expert. Well, I wouldn't want to even try. Too much shape rotating going on there. But uh, one of the great things about jiu-jitsu, your body's a shape. You find yourself in every possible permutation, basically, every uh, possible pretzel shape. You know, twisted, intertwined, crushed, crushing. And in all of those cases, you have to also have an account, verbal, you know, one that you could express and state. And in fact, the jujitsu instructors, they'll often put themselves in a position and then talk about it. You find yourself in a position and you have to be able to say what's going on in that position, how it could turn in this direction or that direction, where you need more or less leverage, you know, where your weight should be shifted. So it's a, it's a great and beautiful combination. And again, this idea that you find yourself after sufficient study in a zone where things are just clicking, that's a nice lesson that you can take over into other parts of your life, in my opinion. Apart from deep wisdom into the nature of mastery, jujitsu conveys a practical skill that is just as important to civic virtue, the ability to stand your ground. One of my own students in political philosophy, so you know I teach at millermanschool.com, I have students who take my video lecture courses, I have some students who do private tutoring with me, one of my students brought up jujitsu to me a week before I started my training. He said that when he was accosted and harassed on a college campus for sticking to his ethical positions, which means for raising basic questions about the ideology of the far left, which he didn't agree with, so he you know, raised some questions about it, but he was harassed for doing so. And when that happened, he understood that defending freedom of thought demands an ability to defend oneself physically because today if you're among the mob and you're defending something that the mob dislikes okay fine if there's thousand to one or a hundred to one you may not be able to stand your ground physically if they're armed and you're unarmed you may not be able to stand your ground physically but still there's something about defending free speech or defending principles today or having a spine backbone you have to know how to stand your ground to a certain extent the writer Alex Epstein, whose work on energy policy defends fossil fuels, has also stated this view. In December of 2022, Epstein tweeted that he learned Brazilian jiu-jitsu because, quote, on several occasions in college, I received physical threats for expressing my views, unquote. Now a black belt, Epstein describes how 
Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has kept me safe, in his words, a number of times by helping me de-escalate threatening situations. So that's another important component of it. Again, one component of Jiu-Jitsu, it teaches you something about the nature of mastery. Another one, it teaches you the ability to stand your ground. Of course, mastering Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is no guarantee that your physical safety won't be compromised if you stand your ground before a hostile audience, as I said. And I wouldn't claim that it's the primary reason to practice the sport, but anyone in the arena, you know, anybody involved in culture war politics should at least know something about how to protect themselves and others in the event of confrontation. This is not a call to start fights or to intercede in situations that can get you killed, needless to say. It's only a reminder that the virtue of manliness has always had something to do with the ability to fight, even if virtue as a whole is not reducible to that ability. Writing about liberal education, the great teacher of political philosophy, Leo Strauss, once reflected beautifully on the intellectual experience of understanding. He said, we cannot exert our understanding without from time to time understanding something of importance. And this act of understanding may be accompanied by the awareness of our understanding, by the understanding of understanding, by noesis noesos. And this is so high, so pure, so noble an experience that Aristotle could ascribe it to his God. Okay. Awareness of understanding, the understanding of understanding, the self-knowing knowledge. So high an experience that Aristotle could ascribe it to his God. Strauss was talking about understanding great books, but his words capture something about the joy of learning more broadly, and they apply to jujitsu specifically. Understanding how your body moves and how you can use it to oppose the strategic force of a training partner may not be as deep as understanding whether this world is created or eternal, but it's not trivial. We don't need to be Nietzscheans to recognize that the quality of our thoughts is related to the vitality of our bodies, or that thinking joyously is a kind of dance. Even Socrates danced, and Plato wrestled. We are not disembodied spirits. There is a bodily noesis. You feel a new awareness in your movements, and a new coherence and integrity in your life. So that's what I wrote about my little experience in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, how it maps over onto philosophy and education, what I've learned so far after just a few months in the sport. Again, it gets us to think about the deep wisdom of mastery, gets us to think about courage, the ability to fight, to stand your ground. All of the rites and rituals of the academy, again, the deep respect that the training partners have for one another and for their instructor, the discipline, the commitment, the regularity, the progress, you know, you start off, everybody starts off in the sport, no matter who they think they are, as a white belt, and then you progress. And you don't progress, so far as I know, you know, so far as I can tell from my experience, you don't progress because, you know, you said the flattering thing to the professor who has the ability to give you an A or a B or a C or a D. It's because you've demonstrated competence and expertise and facility and fluency and some of the grammar of jujitsu and some of the movements and motions, escapes, submissions, and so on. Well, as you can see, it's been great for me personally. I did want to say as a disclaimer, I wrote this in my original version, though it didn't make it into the edited version. My disclaimer is that, look, if you did Brazilian jiu-jitsu and you didn't like it, if you prefer some other martial art more, if you did some sort of fighting and you were injured, if you have a bad experience with it because uh, you knew someone who did the sport and he was annoying or something, fine, whatever. Your experiences are completely valid. I'm just telling you what it's been like for me and what it got me thinking about. As somebody who, you should understand that although I'm tall and although I'm like in pretty good health, I've never been a very athletic person and I certainly have never done any martial art before. So the coordination that comes from understanding again what the arms and legs are doing, how, how you're intertwined with the other person, whether you should go this way or that way, all of that's new. Bringing something that's intellectual into the physical bodily expression, that's new. Because again, you can teach Heidegger, Nietzsche, Plato, Strauss, all authors that I love deeply and that I write about and that I teach in my school, and yet do it without ever getting out of the chair, you know? without ever moving anything, except you know your hands to turn the page over. 
jujitsu is not like that. You know, it involves the full body and therefore the awareness that comes with that. It's just, I wanted to share it with you in case you're in that position, in case you're a practic practitioner of the sport. So if you enjoyed this essay, you should go to im1776.com and see the other great things they're publishing there. Of course, I encourage you to go to millermanschool.com for the philosophical, intellectual side of the authors that I mentioned, Heidegger, Strauss, and so on. And uh, in particular, if you do a martial art, and all the more so if you do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to have your comments on what you got out of the sport so far, on how you find, you know, the relationship between the intellectual and the physical component there. And also, you know, what are the things that you see in your academy or that you see in the training center and in the practice of the sport that you think maybe, you know, are missing from society and culture more broadly? Are there things that jujitsu can teach the broader world about um, striving for excellence, about this mutual uh, respect and growth and development and all of those kinds of things? So thanks a lot for watching us. I hope you enjoyed it. I do encourage you to comment. And uh, if you're training, keep training. If you're reading, keep reading. Guys, be well, take care, and uh, see you in the next video.